So welcome everybody to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really wonderful to have you all here and really looking forward to following up on TIG's teaching last week. I think some folks here were here for that and um, it's such a beautiful moment to really consider taking refuge and what that means and finding refuge and having an experience of knowing that we're creating this inner space and this collective space where hopefully we can get a little reprieve from the world and from some of the things that are more difficult and challenging in our everyday lives. And we will continue that this evening, continue with the old path white clouds. Sorry, Jason, is there something you wanted to say? No? Okay. Now we're getting background noise. It's all just connected. <laughs> Maybe if folks aren't speaking, they could mute themselves and that would be great. So we're moving into kind of an interesting section tonight. Well, we're going to start with just a little one that's one chapter that's just a couple pages. So as, as I've mentioned for folks who've been here before, we're following this uh, compiled text by Thich Nhat Hanh, which is a bunch of stories based on the historical life of the Buddha. And some of these stories are like little fragments. Jason, could you mute yourself maybe? That'd be so dope. Thank you. Um, some of these stories are fragments, like they're really short and some of them are much longer. So certain chapters are just like a tiny little teaching. And the first one of those uh, tonight, I wanted to actually go over before we meditate. I think it's a beautiful way to consider doing, especially a sensory meditation and a meditation with sound. Um, before I do so, I'll just say, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. It's really sweet to be together in community and I think it's important always just to keep in mind that part of our connection here together really is in making sure that the folks feel a sense of generosity and kindness here. So we are fortunate to have Sangha members who seem to enjoy to connect and discuss. And part of our practice here together is really embodying the teachings. So embodying compassion and embodying kindness in how we're listening, how we're speaking, and if possible, very high level, even in our thoughts, right? What does it mean to withhold some judgment or try certain things on? And that includes, you know, our difficulties with audio. Maybe the tea water is too hot, right? Maybe our own internet goes out. Like, how can we use the entire experience of being here as our training ground? So just that invitation before we start. And I think folks know, um, but if maybe it's your first time or um, this isn't in the forefront of your mind, it's just so beautiful to remember that this entire center is here because of volunteers and generosity. You know, there's not someone, you know, at the, at the top putting orders in or kind of organizing this business. It's such a beautiful act of being against the stream of our contemporary culture to come together really as like Dharma family. So with that, I will move into our first chapter here that we're gonna cover tonight before our meditation. So this chapter is two and a half pages, and it's chapter 25. Um, again, for those of you who maybe haven't been following along or who've missed a week, um, right in this chapter, we're kind of getting into um, the Buddha who has now left some of his very first teaching uh, disciples. So. Right when he became awakened, he went and found his five closest kind of colleagues who were also studying. Those five close colleagues themselves attained awakening. All of a sudden, like again, this is the series of Buddha going into the woods, running into people and them wanting to be ordained, them telling all their friends, and the Sangha just swelling, right? All these, <clears throat> all these people who want to start joining the Sangha, <clears throat> excuse me, and taking refuge. And in this case, the Buddha has decided that this first group of trained disciples, they're ready. 
He says, go out, spread this teaching. Like, it's really important for you to share what you've learned. And he makes his way um, on his own in the woods. And as he makes his way in the woods, he runs into more people. And in this case, uh, he is in the forest. So much, you know, I've mentioned this before, but so much of what happens along the story of the Buddha and his waking up is in beautiful, intimate relationship with the natural world and being in the forest. And he's, he's there in the forest. Yes. Sorry to interrupt the beautiful moment yeah. of being yes. in the forest. We're having pretty bad buzzing. Okay. On, on the online. And I'm wondering if we can sort of maybe focus the chimes at, and only take off the background when yeah. we do the chimes, or what, what do you think? Because it's just a, yeah. it's a little bit difficult here. No, no, I'm glad you said something. Is Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy's on it. Sorry, everybody. It's okay. We're, we're experimenting, improvising. So then go to the auto ones, I guess. Oh yeah, how about now, Jason? Is that better? Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. All Great. right, thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah. No, audio's audio's really important. I don't need to tell you that. But, um, so here he is in the forest, like really loving being alone, and he had this meditation for a couple hours. And a group of well-dressed young men passed by, obviously agitated over something. Several of them clutched musical instruments, and the young men, man at the head of their party, um, bowed his head to greet the Buddha, and he asked, Monk, did you see a girl run by here? And the Buddha asked, why do you wish to find her? And then the young man recounts their story from beginning they're from the city of Varanasi. They'd enter the forest for a pleasure outing, bringing with them musical instruments and a young woman to entertain them. When they had finished singing and dancing and feasting, they stretched out on the forest floor to take a nap. But when they awoke, they discovered that the young girl had stolen their jewelry and disappeared. They had been chasing her ever since. The Buddha looked calmly at the men and asked, tell me friends, is it better in this moment to find the young woman or to find your own selves? And somehow that wasn't annoying or agitating to them. I mean, likely, again, you'll, you'll hear the descriptions over and over in this book. It's not just like running into some person and saying, hey, have you seen, seen someone? And they're like, why don't you find yourself? You know, it's really, it's really this whatever he is emanating his presence after having um, attained the awakening is, is arresting to people. He embodies the serenity. He embodies this peace. And um, I think I've mentioned before, you know, I've gotten to be in the presence of people who have that level of attainment and that level of compassion and peace. And it feels like a tidal wave of love that is rushing over you. So I think there's already this kind of potentiating factor before he asks this provocative question. Um, the young men were startled and they kind of just reflect for a moment. And they say, respected teacher, perhaps we should try to find ourselves first. And um, he says this beautiful little teaching. He says, life can be found only in the present moment, but our minds rare, rarely dwell in the present moment. Instead, we chase after the past or long for the future. We think we are being ourselves, but in fact, we're almost, we are almost never in real contact with ourselves. Our minds are too busy chasing after yesterday's memory or tomorrow's dreams. The only way to be in touch with your life is to return to the present moment. Once you know how to return to the present moment, you will become awakened. And at that moment, you will find your true self. And I just, this idea is so simple, but we think we are being ourselves, but in fact, we are almost never in real contact with ourselves. Does that resonate for anyone? That feeling of being like at least an hour ahead of ourselves or maybe like a couple of years behind and not in this moment. And he says, look at these tender leaves caressed by the sunlight. Have you ever really looked at the green of the leaves with a serene and awakened heart? The shade of green is one of the wonders of life. If you have never really looked at it, 
please do so now. And the men grew quiet and with their eyes following the Buddha's pointing finger, each one of them looked at the green leaves gently swaying in the afternoon breeze. A moment later, the Buddha turned to the youth sitting on his corner and said, I see you have a flute. So he plays a little flute for um, the group. And somehow or another, after he played it, he decided he might ask the Buddha, how about you play for us? And his friends like crack up or like you're asking the monk to play the flute for us. Little did they know um, the Buddha loved to play the flute. Uh, back in his homeland and was quite, you know, adept at flute. If you don't remember, the Buddha was above head and shoulders above and beyond like everyone, like in his learning and his athleticism and his knowledge. And so flute playing is no surprise. But when he began to play the flute, the sound was as delicate as a thin strand of smoke curling gently from the roof of a simple dwelling at the hour of the evening meal. Slowly, the thin strand expanded across space like gathering clouds in which mm -hmm, in which in which in turn transformed into thousand petal lotus, each petal a different shimmering color. It seemed that one flutist suddenly became 10,000. All the wonders of the universe had been transformed into sounds sounds of a thousand colors and forms, sounds as light as a breeze and quick as the pattering of rain, clear as a crane flying overhead, intimate as a lullaby, bright as a shining jewel, and subtle as the smile of one who has transcended all thoughts of gain and loss. So, so he's a pretty good flute player, you know? And it's just, it's just so beautiful, um, I think, I don't know about some of you in here, but I feel like music was really my first dharma and being able to lose myself in music, like my whole body, my whole sense and have that like enraptured presence. And I wasn't in the future and I wasn't in the past. I was right there in this live music experience. And the way they describe it is, you know, the birds of the forest stop singing in order to listen to the music. Even the breeze ceased rustling the leaves. It was enveloped in an atmosphere of peace, serenity, and wonder. Um, and it says that the young men were just completely refreshed and they dwelled completely in the present moment in touch with all the wonders of the trees. And it's, I've been actually researching a little bit uh, the literature on what are the benefits of sound, sound meditation, sound baths, I'll put that in air quotes, it's defined in a lot of different ways. We're having some of those events here. And there's undeniably something so powerful at engaging our sense of sound and engaging it in, in resonant and meaningful ways. This uh, flute player in the forest, after hearing the Buddha, says, how did you learn that? Like, how, like I want to be your student. And the Buddha says, playing the flute does not depend solely on practicing. I now play better than in the past because I have found my true self. You cannot reach lofty heights in art if you do not first discover the unsurpassable beauty in your own heart. So if you'd like to play the flute truly well, you must find yourself on the path of awakening. So I just, I love that. Um, so I feel like this little tiny chapter helps us, you know, tune into this idea of this basic teaching of presence and of using kind of all of our senses to help us be in the present. And I think it's also a beautiful connection to the relationship of creativity and the Dharma. So there has been also some, some research and exploration of how meditation and mindfulness helps creativity, which probably has to do with, it's pretty hard to be creative when your thoughts and your mind are like, you know, all kind of stuck with one another. And that decentering or that sense of spaciousness we get in practice, it's kind of the, the ground at which new ideas can arise, connections can be seen. Um, so I thought for our meditation tonight, we kind of take a little of this inspiration from the sensory world and do a practice essentially of, of resonating with sound. I have... Um, this pair of chimes I just brought back from Kathmandu in the fall. 
And it was such a joy. Um, I thought about bringing them here to the Dharma Collective and it was a shop. For those of you who've been to Kathmandu, it's like you'll go into shop and the entire shop is like chimes, right? And another shop, it's like all prayer bowls. Another shop, all prayer beads. And there's like a lot of chimes in there. And I felt so much in the present moment, just listening to the tones and really finding the one that resonates for resonated for me. And I hope it will for you. But I think the simple practice of allowing ourselves to really deeply listen from the very kind of like acute sound of the chime all the way till its end, such a beautiful way to focus on the present moment. It, it's a shamatha practice. It's a way to develop attention, but it's one that often can come easier and bring that kind of sense of pleasure that arises when we're focused in one place. So that's going to be a lot of our practice will give us a little setup um, and settling in. But Jimmy, do you mind changing it up? So let's come to a posture that feels supportive this time together. For those of us sitting in chairs, I, I really had the beautiful opportunity on retreat last week. I have a bit of a issue with my knee, so I can't sit cross-legged. So I did all this chair sitting and over the week of exploration, I just found this experience of having hands on legs, the kind of classic grounding into the earth posture. It's so powerful. So I invite you to try that out if that feels comfortable, but hands folded in lap, also great. And finding an upright spine that feels a sense of vividness and also a sense of dignity. Just recognizing the power of coming to practice. And then feeling a sense of softness and gentleness through the face, blossoming in the chest and through the belly. And deeply feel the ground supporting you. And as we begin by settling into the body, consider, imagine, or invite this quality of stillness in the body. Stillness like a great mountain as a stable base in which all the thoughts and memories and images can just pass by. as though they were clouds or wind, which could ruffle the leaves of the trees on the mountain, but the mountain remains with that quality of true and deep stillness. Feeling and inviting stillness all the way down from the crown of the head to the toes.
And then shifting and inviting, imagining, considering a quality of openness. Openness that's permeating the mind. Openness in front of us and openness behind us. Openness to each side. If we imagine the stillness dropping us all the way down, then the openness can invite us to expand. And then we invite a quality of inner silence. And well, for those of us at the center, it's certainly not silent all around us. The silence is actually an aspiration, an intention. Releasing the constant inner narrative these wonderful protectors and planners that fill our mind with to-do lists and next steps and recycling and remembering events from the day. So consider and imagine and invite a quality of deep inner silence. This doesn't mean not hearing the sounds around us. It means not engaging with the train of thoughts. A couple more moments here to really drop in, inviting these qualities of stillness, openness, and silence. This might feel like ease or relaxation. It might feel like vibrancy, a full presence in the body.
And taking a moment here to consider our intention for being together tonight. So beautiful to bring forth this guiding light, this motivation, this heart's desire. It could be something quite familiar or something arising newly in this moment. Then gently shifting our practice and again, kind of calibrating our attention and awareness in the body, our sensory experiences, feeling and experience of tactile sensations in the body, And inviting this openness to the next part of our practice, really listening and tuning in to sound. And as we listen to sound, we do so with this gentle, curious kindness. It's a way of training our attention to not reach out and lean towards what's coming, but to just receive really listening through the entire resonance of the sound, letting it fill the sensory experience in the body, of course, through the ears, and letting it be the full area of attention, as though our attention were a spotlight directed just onto sound. and softening in the body. And just continuing to notice with gentle curiosity and kindness, the experience of receiving sound. For those of us in the center, where we have quite a collage of different sounds from above and outside, seeing if we can just let whatever is heard resonate through us without any judgment or preference. Allowing our mind, heart, and body to dwell in the present moment by focusing on the sensory experience of sound.
I'm considering a sense of letting go and releasing as the sound dissipates. As much as possible, feeling a sense of openness, expansiveness. A readiness for the next sound to arise. And continue simply being open to sound. Allowing sound to be the area of attention. And as much as possible, withholding judgment about which sounds are arising. Even an idea about what they are, what they should be. Just receiving sound as sound. Tone and frequency, pitch. Feeling how sound is experienced through the body. Letting the sound really make us present, tethered here through our senses to this moment. And when the mind gets caught up in a distracting thought or memory or image, no problem. Just relax and refresh your interest in focusing on sound, focusing on the experience of being embodied with sound.
You may notice that the body tenses around certain sounds. Feel that contraction as much as possible, remembering the space, the stillness, the openness. The next bell will be the end of our practice. Seeing if you can continue sustaining that sense of openness, even through the very last part of the bell's ring. Thank you for your practice. Thank you, Jimmy. 24th Street really decided to show up for us tonight, huh? They're like, sound meditation? We got that. <laughs> Let's walk upstairs, play some banging music outside. Some moment I thought the police were coming. I was like, oh boy. Oh. <laughs> Yes, Jason. I want to make a comment too that um, interesting effect of the online way we have the Zoom set up. As, as the bell rang, the buzz went away, but as the sound faded, the buzz got louder. So it's like this kind of, there was this envelope. It was interesting. I mean, talk about meditation, like it was kind of part of the experience. But for us, we had very strange effects as well. Well, but the bell sounded great. That's <laughs> good to hear. Yeah, there are limits of what you can do online and in person. I hope it wasn't too distracting for folks online. Any thoughts, reflections, questions on that practice? Yeah. Um, do you mind using that? Yeah. Um, I have found the sound meditation really effective and just allowing me to feel more open. And one of the, I've experienced it here in a sound meditation, um, this kind of openness to the sound, like maybe one of my least favorite sounds, which is loud motorcycles. It like feels like just nails grating across my soul. And I had this amazing experience once here of feeling openness and okayness and like a lack of differentiation between me and that noise. That was mm. really amazing. So I found myself being like, come on, come on, loud motorcycle. Give me the chance to practice with it. Um, and I didn't get, we got everything else, but, um, but it is, I've just noticed like doing this again, it kind of, reminds me of how really unpleasant it is both to have that reaction and to watch my own reaction to it. Yeah. Um, and that charge it gives my body and the animosity that it makes me feel for the person. And so it's like both the experience, the sensory experience, and then my own awareness of the sensory experience. Yeah. And so this was just such a nice reminder yeah. that like, Oh, right. I have had a different experience with that. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And such a great way to like take what, another cut at dependent origination, right? Like seeing that 
there's a sensory experience, but that's not the totality of our experience. It's including whatever we're hearing from our senses, whatever we're putting upon it, right? And with the loud motorcycle riding person, like who knows the trauma they've overcome in their life and how effective this might be for them feeling manifest in the world, like just all that. Um, but I think how you describe just the, the true like imprisonment of being locked in our judgments about the sounds. And um, I drove today, I, I don't drive super often, so I'm still just like blown away by bad driving. Um, and I, it's amazing how like it so quickly, like someone does this or the other thing I don't think is right. And I'm like, that's clearly a bad person. Like they're an idiot. They're a, even worse, right? You know, just that it's so immediate. And it uh, it's a little discouraging to realize, you know, how much of an uphill battle it is to really address our judgment, you know, and judgment about everything all the time. Um, it's kind of part of our perceptual landscape, right? It's how we see the world, how we interpret the world. And that's not necessarily wrong, but when it creates that, like kind of envelops us in the negativity. Yeah. We get really ripped off. Right. Yeah. Anybody else that rich sound bath we just had of 24 street for folks online. Is the sound better now, by the way, Jason, for us? Okay, cool. I'd like to, to chime yeah. in. Okay. okay, great. No pun intended or pun intended? Ah, it just slipped <laughs> out. It's serendipity. But I'm a sound person. And, and so I spend yeah. you know, most of my waking life focused on sound. And I find such joy in the symphony of the world that is happening all the time. And when I'm aware of it and I'm not fighting it, it's joyous. You know, it, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be 24th Street and blaring motorcycles or car alarms or, mm. or just a sort of cacophony of urban life. Um, but but it's almost like when we not when we when we pause to to appreciate it, like the leaves the Buddha was noticing. I think that yeah. one thing that I tend to do in my life is just continually point to the the leaves the sound where each sound is a leaf and it's like don't let it go by without without blocking it because the blocking is like yes what practice not doing the blocking is actually the suffering so listening doesn't it listening can be painful at a certain decibel level like if you're on bart and you're going through the tunnel and you're just you know, there's like, that's pain, but most of the sounds we hear, <laughs> are, they're not physically dangerous. So it's just more a matter of sort of psychologically and, and spiritually just zoom, tone, tuning in. And, uh, and I find myself doing that with this, this practice tonight. Thank you. Yeah, you're so overqualified for this practice. Um, and it, it's really, I love what you're bringing up, the kind of the blocking. Um, I don't know if folks notice, like, the body contracts when we hear sounds we don't like. It's pretty quick. Like it's like a, and that happens all the time, every day. And we're just kind of like creating that pattern. And I'm not saying like, it's a, we need to stop. And, you know, it's your fault that you contract, but just to notice that the impact of, of sounds and our reaction to them is not just mental, right? It's a physiological experience. And from the public health lens, people who live closer to freeways often have poor public health and it's thought to be actually as a result of the persistent high decibel of the cars going by. And so I'm not saying like, oh yeah, they need to learn how to relax around that sound, but just to recognize that our response to sound is, is, is a deeply embodied experience and yeah, we can do our best to bring awareness to it and, you know, be more like Jason and have that sense of like, what a fantastic cacophony. This is like 24th Street Symphony. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. I kind of found the sound meditation quite difficult compared yeah. to focusing on your breath. Mm. I think because the breath is like quite continuous and yes. 
not really spatially distributed. Yeah. It's just here or something. So yeah. you can just focus on that without kind of uh, imagining it as an object. Hmm. Whereas I really struggled to not be like, oh, there's a motorcycle and yes. it's, it's behind me and now it's in front of me and, mm -hmm. you know, and then above me is this sound and like, and then you just start thinking about like, I'm like picturing the person upstairs yeah. walking around or something. Right? Yeah. And then I'm not thinking about the sound anymore. Yep. Or my experience. Yeah. But then you come back. Well, yeah, that's the hope, but yeah, but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's a little rare that breathing is easy. So I like bow down. Yeah. That. Well, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> but, um, but I, I love that noticing of that part of the sound, um, practice. Cause I think one of the things I love about sound meditation actually is that requirement that we kind of notice that the sound rises and falls away. Cause I do think sound meditation is easier for most of us than, uh, the settling our mind into the natural state or watching thoughts go by. I mean, that's really hard to do, right? Like the thought arises, like, oh, that, what is that? Like we're thinking and then we recognize it. And sometimes with the sounds, not always, the sound arises as sound. And like in what is heard, it is simply heard and it passes. And I feel like that's the blueprint for how we could be with our thoughts. Like it's almost like training wheels for how to start responding to our thoughts, which have that same quality of like, kind of coming and going and it is it's a really interesting it's a really interesting practice and for me I find it's one I can do and I'm not really prepared to actually do a meditation but I want to be in the environment I'm in and just like really feel a sense of connection but centering and refocusing so I'd be curious if you try it in like um shorter bursts yeah, like how it how it comes up. Um, not maybe while you're talking with people, because then you know you're zoning out and not paying attention. But you can pretty much do it all the time. So like Jason, when you said Bart, there was like all these like faces of like terror and disgust in the room. Yeah, I know it's got. I mean, I'm a lifelong Bart writer. It has gotten so bad. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What can you do? Our, our, our um, ever more challenged world with all. And I do think, you know, I do think it's likely that, of course, adversity will continue and, and maybe things will even get harder in our world. So part of our practice here is like training for greater adversity. Like how do we, in the practice of meditation, notice to relax a little around the things we don't like? you know, because they're going to keep coming and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a humbling practice, but I, I do think getting that motorcycle experience of it's just sound, it makes it all worth it. So, yeah. Any other thoughts on sound before we move on to the rest of the chapter? Yeah. Yes, I like, I love the Vegas move with that mic. <laughs> um, it's very challenging. A while back, I think you were talking about thoughts and how I think you said, I think it was you who said that sometimes you feel like the thought is like this, yes. like on, on your face. And when you said that, I, my reaction was that that's my experience with sound. Mm. For me, part of it has to do with my PTSD and being and being on hyper alert. Yeah. And one thing that I observed is that is part of that experience for me is when I can't see where it's coming from. Mm, yeah. So I think that this was in a way like talk about practicing adversity was sort of like the perfect storm for me for mm. that because I'm inside. I can't see what's what's happening both yeah. outside and upstairs. For you, those, those folks at home, we can also hear people upstairs, and and my and your, my, your eyes are closed too, and I want to know so that I can decipher if it's safe and if yeah. I approve of it or not as well too. Yeah. And I part of the experience for me because I was thinking about the the discussion last week about um, refuge, right? And so it's like how it's like where is my refuge in this? Because mm -hmm. my my takeaway from that class was. 
that I spent a lot of my life trying to control the outside world in order to make, to make that the refuge, which is obviously not, which is obviously a losing battle, you know, that there has to be something else that is more reliable than that. And I really didn't have an answer for what that is in Mm. that situation because, Mm. and I also know that different people have different sort of sensory processing systems yeah. too, and that people experience different senses in different ways. And so for me as well, that could just be that for me, sound is, I have a, a, a unique relationship with it too. Mm. And so what do I do with that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And um, just, and I, I should have mentioned this, but always welcome to open eyes during practice wouldn't have been that satisfying so we can't see through the walls that well but sometimes just having the eyes open can be really helpful to feel more grounded um and you know for a while or once or twice mace has mentioned like i am here at the door um and i because i agree like and i can even like see out this window a little right and it feels like a like a this like it's too porous like i want us to be closed in i want that sense of of safety and I do think, or forget to think, I do know that it's really hard to practice if we don't have some level of safety, that some place of safety we can hold on to. Um, And so it could be, especially for for any practice, whether you're doing a sound practice or practice with mind or breathing and it doesn't feel right. Because for some people, the practice of breathing is a great trigger for PTSD or other trauma. And it is like, what is this place of healthy refuge in myself? It can be an exploration. I really doubt there is one that works for everyone. And I actually guess just through my own observation and um, teaching and looking at the literature that what it is that's our refuge or what's a good intervention for us, that could change over time or even day to day. So like today, I found it extremely soothing to listen to music when I was feeling overstimulated. But yesterday I wanted silence, like just as a simple example right so how do we have almost like our apothecary of those practices and another one that can be helpful again if feeling overstimulated like it it was a lot of sound here and it's not like the the sound was threatening but i don't know it wasn't exactly like children laughing either right like there's different kinds of sounds um and so other practices could and can include you know focusing on very like neutral areas of the body, like the elbows or the toes, Um, finding a place in the room that we can just like focus on to distract momentarily, and then either decide to come back to the practice or continue like looking and distracting. And I do think it's so important for all of us to have um, a sense of freedom and empowerment in our practice to do what we need and to really kind of feel that because yeah and especially when we're working with you know acute or ongoing um, challenges or difficulties it's um, really useful to have a variety of ways to have our practice be able to suit us or find like you're describing like little refuges even within our practice itself does anybody have a refuge they use in practice when they're feeling like overwhelmed or challenged I'd like to um, chime in. I don't want to take space. Somebody else wants yeah. to talk. Sort of my, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy to be talking about sound. Um, but I, I tend to find that what I'm aware of is when I'm either feeling threatened or annoyed. And they're two really different qualities, but sounds can mm-hmm. kind of carry, there's a lot more annoyance for me than real threat. And that when I focus on annoyance, it's like, I'm sometimes annoyed by thoughts in the same way when meditating, a sound comes mm. up and I, I don't want to hear that. Right. And it's like, yeah, not wanting it leads to annoyance. It's not like I'm afraid that that motorcycle that's driving by is going to drive over me, but somehow mm-hmm. I'm just annoyed that they're doing that. And the, the practice of just noticing the annoyance first, you know, just like notice yeah. what the body does when you're annoyed Hmm. and 
the sound actually becomes kind of interesting because what that that thing that somebody was mentioning about sounds moving all sounds move in a spatial arrangement and you can just just spend amazing time just listening to how it's moving it's not gonna if, if you know it's not gonna hurt you you're not annoyed you're not threatened then you can let go and enjoy it but usually it's the annoyance that's in the way and so i'm i'm often working with that myself and that the refuge for that is just like it's not going to go away. I can't find an anechoic chamber where I'm getting away from the sound, but I will change my attitude about it. And that's a refuge that I often go to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think for annoyance, that would work, like the judgment, but I think for safety, it's a little harder. Um, it's like a little bit of a different quality. Um, and I again, I just invite us, if it feels worthwhile, to just notice the different experience in the body with different sounds, maybe just for the next day or two and really tune into that. It's a, it's an interesting way to assess and engage with our environment. Um, yeah. So the next chapter here gets us into a really interesting um, area. It's uh, the Buddha decides to go back to the little village or Uvela where he in the Bodhi tree nearby woke up. And he was supported by the little children in that village. Mm. The Buffalo boy, who's a, a big character in this story, who helped cut the grass that the Buddha used for his cushion. To be honest, I'm really happy I have like a full cushion. I don't know if I would want to meditate on grass, but it worked for him. And when he goes back to the village, he discovers that a, a large group of practitioners of a spiritual community has moved in near the village. And this group of spiritual practitioners, um, unlike, you know, the, the Buddha and other monks, they don't shave their head. They have really long hair and they braid it on top of their head. And the main kind of um, purpose, or I'd say the, the essence of their religious uh, intent is that fire is the most important thing to worship. So in certain texts, these are called the fire worshipers. And this, uh, the Buddha's really interested, like, oh, here's this big spiritual community. Let me go find out more. And he goes and introduces his, himself to the main teacher, whose name is Kasapa. And um, yeah, it's, it's really curious, this little story about Buddha getting to know this great master teacher. So he has a, pop, he has a spiritual community of 500. And his younger brother, who's a little while down the river, has 300. And his older brother to the east has like another 500. So these three brothers have this huge spiritual community. And, you know, the primary aspect of the spiritual community is about fire as a way of life. So he says, um, mm -hmm -hmm. fire was the basic essence of the universe. It has its source in Brahma, the main altar of the community, the fire sanctuary, always kept a sacred fire burning. Fire itself was the image of Brahma. The scripture of the, scripture, um, of the ancient Vedas spoke of fire worship. Fire was life. Without fire, there could be no life. Fire was light, warmth, the source of the sun, which enabled plants, animals, and people to live. It chased away dark shadows, conquered the cold, brought joy and vitality to beings. Food was made edible by fire. Thanks to fire, people reunited with the Brahma at death. Because fire was the source of all life, it was Brahma himself. Agni, the god of fire, was one of thousands of manifestations of Brahma. So kind of this whole um, cosmology, you know, based around fire and they also do a, a kind of sacrifice of animals in the fire. And they, uh, but the community has like very strict uh, precepts and austerities. Then they pray diligently to follow the path that, to lead to liberation. And some of you may remember that in the early life of the Buddha, he spent a lot of time studying um, this kind of Brahmin um, text based in the Vedas. and was very curious and interested by this, you know, way of living and teaching. He himself didn't find it a path of liberation um, and also found that many of the uh, Brahmins who he saw 
operating in different villages were taking money for these kind of required rights. Like if you build a new part of your home, you have to get a Brahmin blessing. If you have a new kid, you go to do get married, all of it requires a blessing and the blessing requires money. And he felt that it was a, a corrupt system. But luckily, Kasapa really, you know, he has this really strong kind of also social justice bent and doesn't want anyone to charge for this or anyone to acquire wealth. Um, and, you know, this idea of focusing, centralizing on one thing like fire. Fire is pretty great. Like those points make sense. And so the interesting discourse that Buddha has with this kind of very popular spiritual master, they kind of pull apart um, the root of his thinking in order to supplant it with dependent origination. It goes over the course of a couple of days. So the Buddha starts by asking him, what do you think of those who regard water as the fundamental essence of life? Water is the element which purifies and returns people to union. Um, and, you know, they kind of have this debate where he says, water cannot help one attain liberation. Water flows down. Only fire rises. And he says, Buddha says, that's not accurate. The white clouds floating above are also a form of water. Water rises too. So this idea that any one thing, like fire or water, and it's not that Buddha's saying, let's worship water. He's saying, let's stop worshiping one thing. Let's recognize the fundamental interdependence of all things. And then I was looking up a little bit about Kasapa. He's, he's an interesting figure. And um, some of the other stories and writings, they call him the serpent god. And they... Uh, you know, they have this worship of fire, but what Buddha ends up doing to kind of edge his way in to Kasapa and get himself, um, get Kasapa more curious about his own beliefs is he starts showing some of his kind of miraculous powers. So again, this is a little beyond the secular, but um, the idea is that the Buddha really developed some sense for sure of kind of um, prescience, like knowing what was going to happen being able to read others' minds quite well. And uh, he um, also was able to kind of have a sense that Kasapa, this might, you might not need to read his mind. Kasapa was worried and a little kind of um, concerned that the Buddha was a more powerful teacher than him. He recognized quite quickly how impressive this monk was. And so in one of the first weeks that the Buddha was staying with Kasapa, Kasapa was going to have a huge event where a thousand people came and the Buddha recognized he might feel threatened and the Buddha took a day away. And when he returned, Kasapa said, why did you go away? And the Buddha kind of demurs and he realizes, wow, his kindness of not being there so that Kasapa wouldn't feel threatened and also being able to kind of read into his own heart of recognizing that. And then the Buddha continues his discourse with Kasapa and wants to stay is like spending the night in the, um, in the fire altar. And they're all very worried about Buddha staying in the fire altar because there's been this huge snake, big Naga, and they worry it will harm the Buddha. And the, uh, the Buddha says, I'm really not worried about wild animals. From all his time in the woods, he felt like a deep kinship. And there's a kind of story of him just sending so much love to the snake that the snake returned to the forest all, all on its own. So there were these kind of um, acts of benevolence, kindness, but they're also interpreted as kind of acts of, of magic or miracle. And Kasapa really starts kind of getting a little bit worn down by the Buddha. Um, and for him, it's, it's really confusing some of the, the ideas that the Buddha is presenting, especially the idea that, you know, we are not a separate and distinct self. And Kasapa is concerned, well, if I'm not a separate and distinct self, why would I even practice? Why, who would be liberated if I believe in these ideas? Um, and he says, for a long time, humans have been trapped by the concept of Atman, the concept of a separate and eternal self. We have believed that when our body dies, the self continues to exist and seeks union with its source, which is Brahma. But friend, that is a fundamental misunderstanding, which has caused countless generations to go astray. 
All things exist because of interdependence. All things cease to be because of interdependence. This is because that is. This is not because that is not. This is born because that is born. This dies because that dies. This is the wonderful law of dependent co-arising, which I've discovered in my meditation. In truth, there is nothing which is separate and eternal. There is no self, whether a higher or lower self. Kasapa, have you ever meditated on your body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness? A person is made up of these five aggregates. They are continuously changing. They are changing like rivers in which one cannot find even one permanent element. And then Kasapa says, okay, could you say that you teach the doctrine of no self? <laughs> and he said, no, the concept of no self is one narrow view among a whole forest of narrow views. The concept of no self is just as false as the concept of a separate self. Look at the surface of the lotus pond. I do not say that the water and the lotus do not exist. I only say that the water and the lotus arise thanks to the presence and interpenetration of all other elements, none of which are separate or permanent. And if there is no self, why should one practice spiritual paths, says Kasapa, in order to attain liberation? Who will be liberated? And then, as, as is so often the case, the Buddha, he looks deeply into the eyes of this teacher and he says, look for the answer within yourself. So really kind of offering him to look into himself. But I'm, I'm curious from, from you all, we've talked about this idea of no self and dependent origination, um, but it's still, it's this tricky concept. Um, and I, I can really understand Pisapa's difficulty here. Like, what does it mean? Like, who is practicing and what for? So curious if any folks have questions about that or thoughts about that, just this kind of essence in a way of these teachings. What does it mean to have this idea that everything is connected and because everything is connected, there is no separate enduring self? Yeah, that's another pop quiz, I know, but I just, it's so easy to listen to this and not think about it, not apply it. Like if we were Kasapa going out and trying to like look within and, you know, we didn't, we didn't have this text. We didn't have the other teachings. Like how would we try that on for ourselves? Or how have you experienced that in your own practice? Yeah. Going back um, a little bit here, this, you know, this is really like at the very essence of when the Buddha awakened, like a perfect example is him looking at the leaf on the Kapala tree and noticing in the leaf, all the factors that led to the leaf, noticing that the leaf wouldn't be there without the rain, without the soil, without, um, you know, that seed that had made the tree itself. And so in that context, dependent origination really says that, you know, even though the leaf is kind of this separate entity. The leaf represents the kind of all these different aspects at once. We can also apply that idea to our experience, right? The sound of the motorcycle. It's not just the sound of the motorcycle. It's us imposing a specific view upon that experience. And honestly, our sp specific view on that experience comes from so such a huge range of experiences as well. That so we know about our perception, the way that we actually interact with the world. It's not just like, I see that wall exactly as it is. I see that wall through all of my conditioning up until this moment. Like, I like that blue or I don't like that blue. You know, I like plants or, oh, those plants remind me of my first um, school or they had that same shelf. I hate that shelf. Like that, it's not that there's any specific solid thing. There's just this intensive collaboration of causes and conditions that lead to all things. God, I hope I did that. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such an, such a simple construct and one that's like so well supported by physics, for example, but actually like really hard to remember. 
<clears throat> and interesting again, like for this fire worshiper or for people who just, you know, you want to have like a view of ourselves and the world that it's like a certain way. I think that makes us feel like there's more control. We don't actually get more control, but I think it's really alluring that view of some sort of fixed sense of who we are and who others are. Yeah. May, I, may I say something? Yes. Okay. Well, when I read this, I got, I, I can't even describe how elevated I was. I was looking at page 172 in the third paragraph. You know, this is just a shorthand. This is, this is because that is. This yeah. is because that is not, right? It's all one. And so then the Buddha looked, okay, and then Kasapa says, well, who's going to get liberated if there's no, and then the Buddha looked deeply into the eyes of his Brahmana friend. His gaze was radiant as the sun and as gentle as the soft moonlight. He smiled and he said, Kasapa, look for the answer within yourself. When I read that, yeah. it was like, we lift. If I'm liberated, everybody is. We're all one thing. So we're all, mm -hmm. so I just, it's hard to describe it. When I read that, I just felt so elevated. It, I had an insight that mm. we all are liberated. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And, and just that benevolence and that also, this is kind of an obvious statement, but like the Buddha is a great teacher, right? He's not trying to tell people what to think. He's trying to show them through their direct experience and that that then arises and we have a greater understanding of ourselves. And, you know, just as you describe, even you know, reading about that process can be very, you can get the transmission um, of that teaching. Yeah. So it doesn't say Kasapa's reaction, but he ended up joining up, right? And then <laughs> having a little chat with his people and they're like, yeah, 500. And then there's 36 groups of these other people. And then at the, and then you read a couple of chapters. It's like, because it was so, it's kind of hard to describe it. It's or put into words, but just that if I could really live from that point of view that this is because that is, this is not because yeah. it is not. In, in seeking to liberate myself, we can all be liberated. We're all, it all, it all affects, every, it all affects everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think he, he takes mercy a little bit on Kasapa because again, you know, they come back to talk and um, he says, the other day you spoke about meditation on one's body, feelings, perceptions, and formations and consciousness. I've been practicing that meditation and I've begun to understand how one's feelings and perceptions determine the quality of one's life. So we were talking about that, right? That how we react to the sounds or these other experiences in our life, our thoughts, that is the feelings and perceptions determine the quality of life. I also see there's no permanent element to be found in any of the five rivers. So in any of our experiences, they're always changing sensory and mental formations and I can even see that a belief in a separate self is false, but I don't understand like, still why one should follow a spiritual path if there's no self. Who is there to be liberated? Um, yeah, who is there to be liberated? That's to me, it's just like, well, we can't really, it's really, I think he got an insight and that's why Kasapa was, was like, you know, he's asking, it's that intellect. You know, I just read this book about an early Zen center person and they're all this striving and striving and striving. And I have, there's another teacher I train with, you might know Tenzin Yang Yunpate. And he yeah. talks about efforting, stop efforting. It's, you know, but I think he yeah. had, Kasapa had the insight of the big everything. And then that yeah. all that questioning stopped. Yeah, I mean, this is- it. This is like a page later. So he's still questioning, but he's getting there. And his, um, you know, he, he also like the Buddha really goes back to this very nature of the cause of suffering, you know, like why and what are we suffering about? And if we see that the cause or the nature of our suffering is this identification with the self, we might start to get more motivated. Um, and yeah, he, he kind of like takes a little mercy on him and helps him see that the cause of suffering is ignorance and the false way of looking at reality. Thinking that the impermanent is permanent is ignorance. Thinking there's a self when there's no self is ignorance. From ignorance is born greed, anger, fear, and jealousy. 
think about the world we live in right now, where there's a lot of greed, anger, fear, and jealousy. And there's a lot of individualistic um, and not collectivistic point of view, let alone like um, that's just one cut of it, you know, just having this sense that it's not all about us and that we are not separate. Um, and this idea of interdependence, that big everything, like you're describing, it's such an important realization, but it's actually very threatening. And even this, again, very accomplished spiritual master who's been spending his whole life thinking about spiritual teachings, he's struggling so hard um, to let go of his system of belief. Um, and it's, he gives this final um, kind of analogy that, that Buddha kind of uses a metaphor and he points to the river and he says, if a person wants to cross to the other shore, what should they do? And he says, if the water is shallow, he can wade across. Otherwise, he'll have to swim or row a boat across. I agree, says the Buddha, but what if he's unwilling to wade, swim, or row a boat? What if he just stands on this side of the river and prays to the other shore to come to him? What would you think of such a man? I would say he's quite foolish. Just so, Kasapa. If one doesn't overcome ignorance and mental obstructions, one cannot cross to the other side to liberation, even if one spends one whole, one's whole life praying. Suddenly, Kasapa burst into tears and prostrated himself before the Buddha. Gautama, I have wasted more than half my life. Please accept me, accept me as your disciple. Give me the chance to study and practice the way of liberation with you. So it's just this, you know, you know, very kind, but finally kind of firm of like, stop praying, you know, start experiencing, start really looking at this nature of ignorance instead of praying for liberation to come to you, you know, pull apart the very inner shackles that keep you away from that within you. So, very beautiful. And then just as Diane suggested, not only does Kasapa become a disciple, all of his disciples become disciples. All of his brother's disciples become, and all of a sudden the Sangha is like, you know, quadrupled in size. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really interesting. You know, they didn't have influencers or YouTube, like getting the word out was hard. And for this, for these teachings to spread and just like, truly like people just falling to their knees, like across the board. I can only imagine, you know, it seems like we live in the most degenerate of all times. And yet I don't think it's that unique. Like for people to be like, just so eager for this kind of liberation, there's gotta be a lot of suffering. And I think suffering of inequality, you know, and even for those like so much of um, what we hear in the story of the Buddha, like he is a very privileged man and he's meeting many other very privileged people but whose misery is profound. Um, the uh, annual world happiness report came out two weeks ago. I don't know if people ever look at that. It's free online. Some United Nations um, researchers put it together. And one of the things they found for many years, it's the 10th year of the report, is there's less happiness in countries where there's greater disparity economically. And, you know, this inequality does create and impede a sense of well-being and happiness. Um, so I think part of what we're seeing in this time of the Buddha with like these like huge income inequality is, of course, the suffering of those who don't have enough, but also the suffering of those who are kind of overindulged or um, sense the kind of uh, inequality all around them. And it makes it impossible for them to feel at peace and at ease. Kind of resonant, hopefully, with um, some of the themes that we're all looking for. And I think, yeah, I think it's um, still such a challenge for many of us to feel that supporting and kind of excavating and generating our own sense of awake nature is, is the very best thing we can do first to address the many challenges and suffering in our world. But I think I feel really kind of assured and confirmed by these teachings in this book and seeing just how 
profoundly supportive it is for us to, or for them to create Sangha and to create the conditions for change with one another and conditions for change within themselves. So with that, I feel like it would be good for us to dedicate our merit together. The dedication of merit, you know, arguably one of the most important parts of our practice. This time to really reflect on our own intentions for coming here. And also to consider the possibility that our presence here, our collective presence here, is in the service of the greater well being. And using our breath, really considering how we can offer up anything that might have been touched or open, any invisible or unseen benefit of our time here together. We symbolically and in a heartfelt way offer our time together with these teachings for the sake of all beings. So may this collective presence be of service. May this collective presence further the possibility that all beings could be happy. And all beings could be free. And all beings would know the true causes of happiness. And that all beings would feel safe loved, and eats. Thank you all for being here, showing up for your intentions. And uh, I'm sure we have some fun stuff this weekend the next weekend for sure. Mama Solcha Malioni is coming next weekend on Sunday. I really recommend you, you join and like get your tickets now because it will sell out for sure. It's like 800 Bay Area Paramandala Sangha are going to be wanting up in this place. And Feeding Your Demons, some of you have done that on evenings we've had here and doing it in person with um, the teacher who generated that practice is pretty outrageous. What it really offers us is a chance to turn towards our difficult experiences and through dialogue and visualization, like hopefully find understanding and even find compassion and peace. Some of us, myself and another um, Scientists did a study on feeding your demons based at the old Dharma Collective site for Against the Stream. And those studies just came out this fall, a qualitative and a quantitative study on feeding your demons. And we'll be sharing some data from that study. Lama will be presenting feeding your demons. It'll be awesome. Collective demon feeding. So that's next Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m.